which makes no commitment to go to conference, we're going to try to attach the Senate bill to the extension and send it into conference. And I hope my friends will be here to help me with that. I would yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Illinois. I see my friend and colleague from Alaska is on the floor, and I would like to yield to her and ask consent that I be recognized after her statement. Without objection. Thank you. The Senator from Alaska. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate uh, the courtesy of my colleague from, from Illinois, and I also uh, <clears throat> will follow on Senator Boxer's comments in the importance of this highway transportation bill. I think we recognize that, well, uh, far from being perfect, we don't, I'm not convinced that we develop any perfect legislation around here. It is an extraordinarily good faith effort, a very strong bipartisan um, uh, demonstration in this body deserves to have the support. So I, I applaud her and Senator Inhofe for their work on that. Madam President, just very briefly, I wanted to take a few minutes um, this morning to speak about uh, an event that just happened outside on the, the lawn of the Capitol here. Uh, about maybe 50 or 60 Alaskans and some uh, wannabe Alaskans gathered in a, in a rally, a march that uh, we have entitled Choose Respect. And this is an effort that has stemmed from the actions of our governor in Alaska to really shine the spotlight on domestic violence and sexual assault and to come together as communities, uh, as a state, to really speak up and to turn around the statistics that are so devastating in, in our state when it comes to domestic violence and sexual assault. So for the past few years, the, the governor has kind of led the charge um, in organizing rallies in the state of Alaska in the, the last week of, of March. Um, in the state this morning, there will be 120 different rallies going on in, in communities um, like Anchorage and Fairbanks, our larger communities, but also in smaller villages, Huslia, uh, uh, Tanana, communities where uh, the numbers are small, but the passions on the issues, I think, are very, very, very strong and robust. Uh, the governor has um, commissioners in Barrow, in uh, Tanana, in Cordova, in Nome, in Galena, all leading the march to stand up and speak out about domestic violence. And so I want to acknowledge what the governor has done in, in his effort to spotlight this, to, to really work to reduce the rates of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse through this Choose Respect initiative. We've got great Alaskans standing together and um, uh, again a real commitment to make a difference. Unfortunately, and you've heard me say this before, in a state like Alaska where I think we have unparalleled beauty, we also have um, an ugly side to our state that is manifested in, in statistics that we see with violence against women and particularly violence against Native women. Violence against Native women has reached epidemic proportions. We are, we are at, a, at a point where two and a half times higher Native women experience domestic violence, sexual assault at rates two and a half times higher than other races. In the lower 48, women on, on reservations are nearly 10 times more likely to be murdered. Systematic legal barriers, ineffectual and deficient law enforcement mechanisms result in women, children, and families living in fear. In, in Alaska, nearly one in two women have experienced partner violence. Close to one in three have experienced sexual violence. Overall, nearly six in ten Alaska women have been victims of sexual assault or domestic violence. This is absolutely unacceptable. And this is the reality that we're living with as a state now. It's absolutely unacceptable. Alaska's rate of forcible rape between 2003 and 2009 was 2.6 times higher than the national rate. Uh, tragically, we see about 9% of Alaskan mothers who reported physical abuse by their husband or their partner during pregnancy uh, or in the 12 months prior to pregnancy. These are horrifying statistics, <coughs> Madam President. And it takes me to, to the issue of, of violence against women, VAWA, the, the bill that we've been talking about, uh, hopefully bringing to the floor soon. Um, 
a measure like this, I think, is incredibly important for us to stand behind women, men. Uh, doesn't make any difference if you're from a rural part of the country or urban part of the country. It is, it is an issue that I think we know rips at the heart uh, of who we are. In, in so many of the Alaskan villages, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault face some pretty unique challenges, and they're horrific challenges. It may be that there is no full-time law enforcement presence, there's no local uh, justice infrastructure. Um, we have, a, we have, in many situations, where villages are, are, are landlocked. I mean, there's, there's no roads in. The only way in and out is, is by airplane. So you've got a situation where uh, you can have a, 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 an individual who has been uh, victimized, no law enforcement presence in the community whatsoever. It may take state troopers days days to, to be able to respond to an incident depending on weather conditions. So imagine yourself in that situation. You've been a, domestic, a, a victim of domestic violence, you seek help, there is none in the village, and no way away from your perpetrator. Um, I think we recognize that one thing that we can and must do is, is make sure that there is a safety net available to address the immediate survival needs and the survival needs of their children in the short term and only with this level of confidence can, can one gather the courage to, to leave an abusive situation. Uh, one final comment on VAWA and then I will yield to my colleague who has given me the courtesy of the floor right now. I think we recognize in, in Alaska that the Violence Against Women Act does offer a, a, a ray of hope, if you will, for those who not only are the victims but those who help assist the victims of domestic violence and sexual assault in our, in our villages. It will uh, provide for some, some increased resources to our rural and to our very isolated communities. It will help to establish a, 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 a framework for the Alaska Rural Justice Commission, which has been a, a, a great venue, I think, to, to make sure that we're all understanding what the tools are and how we, how we adapt to those tools. And it also recognizes that Alaska's Village Public Safety Officer Program um, is, is considered as that law enforcement so that the VAWA funds can be directed to providing a full-time law enforcement presence in places that have none. We've got a lot of issues that we need to work through. We believe that the reauthorization of VAWA will help us with that. So as we join with other Alaskans in the state and here in Washington, D.C., to, to choose respect for all women, for all in our communities. Uh, I think it's important that there are some tools here that we can put in place uh, to help not only the people of my state, uh, but, but victims of, of domestic violence wherever they may be. And with that, Madam Chair, uh, Madam President, uh, <clears throat> I thank my colleague from Illinois for yielding, and uh, I turn it back to him. Madam President. Senator from Illinois. Madam President, the uh, Senate is not a place for sprinters, only long distance runners because uh, sometimes you need patience beyond human endurance to see an idea that you believe is meritorious finally make it to get passed by the United States Senate and maybe even the House or maybe even signed into law. Sometimes it happens quickly. More often, it takes a long time. My personal story that kind of leads when it comes to examples is the DREAM Act, which I introduced 11 years ago. This was legislation that addressed a problem that I learned about in my Chicago office. We got a phone call, and the phone call was from a mother. She was Korean American, and she ran a dry cleaners. And in Chicago, 75% or more of the dry cleaner establishments are owned by Korean families. She had come to this country years before, brought her little girl with her, and then raised a family and she became an American citizen. Fast forward to her little girl who became a musical prodigy. In fact, was in demand at some of the best music institutions in America, Juilliard School of Music, the Manhattan Conservatory of Music, offering her admission to come and develop her skills as a concert pianist. And as her daughter filled out the form to apply to these schools, she turned to her mother and said, now, when it says nationality here, what should I write? 
And her mother said, I don't know. We never filed any papers for you after you came to America. And the daughter said, what can we do? And the mother said, we can call Durban. So they called my office, and we checked with the Immigration Service, and they came back and said the law is very clear that when a child is brought to this country and through no fault of their own is undocumented, the law is clear. They have to leave for at least 10 years. They have to go back to wherever they were before or anywhere they want to go, but they can't be here. And I thought to myself, this girl did nothing wrong. Mom and Dad didn't file the papers, and here she is in a predicament. So I introduced the DREAM Act. Here's what it says. Five simple provisions. If you came to the United States as a child, if you've been a long-term U.S. resident, if you have good moral character, if you graduate from high school and you either complete two years of college or serve in the U.S. military, we will put you on a path to become a citizen of the United States. You have to earn it. We're not going to give it to you, but we're going to give you that chance. Just because mom and dad may have done an illegal act, we will not hold you as a child responsible for it. The net result of this bill, when it becomes law, will strengthen our military, and we have the support from military leaders all across the United States. They want these young men and women to enlist. They'll bring diversity to the military and talent. It'll also mean that they'll be contributing to America with their higher education. They're going to be tomorrow's doctors and engineers, soldiers and teachers. We don't want to lose their talents. We don't want them educated in America for 13 years and then cast aside. We want them to stand up and be part of our future and make us a stronger nation. Keep in mind that for most of these students, it comes as a shock when they finally ask the questions and get the answers and realize that the flag they've been pledging allegiance to every single day is not the flag of their country. They are people without a country. That's what the DREAM Act is about, to give them a chance. We've asked the administration, the Obama administration, on a bipartisan basis, not to be deporting these eligible young people, for they've done nothing wrong. If they do something wrong, it's another story. But if they've done nothing wrong, don't focus on deporting them. What we are trying to do is to give them a chance, just a chance, to earn their way to the American dream. I think the administration's new deportation policy is sensible, and I think these young people deserve a chance. But I can give these speeches for a long time, and they don't mean much until you meet the DREAM Act students. Let me show you two of them, two handsome young men from Illinois, Carlos and Rafael Robles. I met them both. Carlos and Rafael were brought to the United States by their parents when they were children. Today, Carlos is 22, Rafael is 21. They grew up in suburban Chicago, in my home state of Illinois. They graduated from Palatine High School, where they were both honors students. In high school, Carlos was a captain of the tennis team and a member of the varsity swim team. He volunteered with Palatine's Physically Challenged program, where every day he helped to feed lunch to special needs students. Carlos graduated from Harper Community College and is now attending Loyola University in Chicago, majoring in education. His dream is to become a teacher. Do we need more good teachers in America? You bet we do. Listen to what one of Carlos' high school teachers said about him. Carlos is the kind of person we want among us because he makes the community better. This is the kind of person you want as a student, the kind of kid you want as a neighbor, the kind of kid you want as a friend to your child and most germane to his present circumstance, the kind of person you want as an American. One of Carlos' college professors wrote and said, he is very simply the finest student I've ever had the opportunity to mentor. Rafael, his younger brother, has a lot in common with Carlos. In high school, Rafael was captain of the tennis team and a member of the varsity swim team and soccer team. He graduated again from Harper Community College. Understand these young men would attend college in America with no federal assistance, none. They've got to pay for it out of their pocket. So he graduated from Harper Community College. Now he's at the University of Illinois in Chicago, where he's majoring in architecture. 
Here is what one of Raphael's teachers in high school said about him. He's a kind of person I've taught about in my social studies class. The American who comes to this country and commits to his community and makes it better for others. Rafi Robles is a young man who makes us better. During my 28-year career as a high school teacher, coach, and administrator, I would place Rafi in the top 5% of all the kids with whom I've ever had contact. Now here's the unfortunate part of the story about these two amazing young men. They are both placed in deportation proceedings. I ask the administration to consider their request to suspend their deportations, and they agreed to do it for the time being. I think it was the right thing to do. Carlos and Rafael are represented by lawyers, volunteer lawyers in Chicago. After I met them, they sent me a letter asking members of Congress to support the DREAM Act, and here's what they said. We ask you today to see it in your heart to do the right thing, to listen and reward the values of hard work and diligence, values that made America the most beautiful and prosperous country in the world, and that we're sure got you as members of Congress to where you are today in life. These are values we have come to admire and respect in the American people. We will continue to uphold these values until the last of our days. We hope eventually, as citizens of the United States, a country we believe is our home. So I asked my colleagues who are critical of the administration's deportation policy or have difficulties with the DREAM Act, would America be a better place if Carlos and Rafael are deported? Of course not. These two young men grew up here. They were educated here. They have done well here. They have earned their way here. They want to be part of our future. And they are not isolated examples. There are literally thousands of them just, just like Carlos and Rafael across this country. Madam President, when I introduced this bill 11 years ago and I would give a speech like this and leave a hall, I could count on, if it were nighttime, I could count on someone standing by my car quietly as I approached and started to leave, and they would ask me, Senator, can I speak to you for a minute? Sure. Senator, I'm one of those students. They were afraid of being deported if they raised their hand and identified themselves at the meeting. That has all changed now, and it's changed for the better. These young men and women are courageously stepping forward to identify themselves. It is no longer a mystery of who they are or what they want to be. They are real flesh and blood. They are children. They are the people that you sit next to in church. They're the folks who are working hard next to your son or daughter in the library at school. You're cheering them on on the football field. You're watching them lead the USC marching Trojan band. You're watching as they are aspiring to become tomorrow's scientists and engineers, doctors, and lawyers, and teachers. They deserve a chance, and we should give them that chance by passing the DREAM Act. I hope that my colleagues will consider doing that as quickly as possible. They want peace of mind, and they want a future, and we need them in America's future. Madam President, I ask consent uh, that the next statement I'm about to be making be placed in a separate part of the record. Without objection. Madam President, in the last few years, we have seen dictator after dictator tumble across the world. Gaddafi in Libya, Ben Ali in Tunisia, Mubarak in Egypt, Saleh in Yemen, and eventually Bashar Assad in Syria. Yet there's one dictator that hangs on. He's the last dictator in Europe. You may not be familiar with his name, but they certainly know him in neighboring countries. He's the strongman president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. For more than 20 years, he has ruled Belarus with an iron fist, using a barbaric combination of repression, intimidation, and torture to maintain power. He is so bold as to continue to call his security services the KGB. Can you imagine? In today's world, calling your security service the same name as the dreaded security service of the Soviet Union, the KGB? Under Lukashenko's reign, elections have been consistently rigged, arrests have been made for political purposes, and the public's basic freedoms of speech, assembly, association, even religion, which we take for granted, are severely restricted. This is Victor, pardon me, Alexander Lukashenko the last dictator in Europe, the president of Belarus. 
On December 19, 2010, Lukashenko was given an opportunity to ease the iron grip of his police state and move closer to democracy by holding a legitimate presidential election. He couldn't bring himself to do it. He orchestrated a fraudulent election, and then he turned, on, turned around on the day of the election and arrested all of his opponents who had the audacity to run against him and threw him in prison. How about that? I was in Belarus shortly afterwards and met with their families. These people were distraught, beside themselves, about what had just happened. One of these detainees, who was eventually released, came and saw me in November. Alex Mikhailovich, one of the presidential candidates, who'd been arrested, tortured, and denied basic legal rights for months. Recently given political asylum in the Czech Republic, where he continues to fight for human rights in Belarus. His wife and daughters, whom I met in Minsk in Belarus, are still being harassed by the KGB as of today. Mikhailovich and others from the hundreds that were imprisoned or released were not so lucky. Stutkovich, a presidential candidate, was sentenced to six years and can barely receive the medical assistance he needs. Andrei Sanikov, another presidential candidate, sentenced to five years in prison for having the boldness to run against this dictator. A number of other activists, political activists, who engage in political activity which we take for granted in the United States have been languishing in prison. I thought about it this week as the demonstrators gathered in front of the Supreme Court marching back and forth with signs how we take that for granted. You try to do that in a country like Belarus, you'll end up in prison. Thank God the United States has a much better standard when it comes to basic rights. Here are the names of some of the other activists Lukashenko's thrown in prison. So Mr. Dushkevich, Edward Lobo, Pavel Savardyarnets, Zinister Bandrinka, Elis Baliakatsky, and I apologize for my mispronunciation on some of these names, Mikhail Arkovich. Authorities frequently torture these activists, trying to pressure them to sign letters admitting a guilt that doesn't exist. But I want to speak about something that's going to come up where Belarus and Lukashenko are going to become international celebrities. On February 16th, Mikhailovich, who I mentioned earlier, was one of the 13 that picketed the headquarters of Prague-based automobile company Skoda, a subsidiary of Volkswagen. Why did they picket Skoda? Skoda is one of the major sponsors of the International Ice Hockey Federation's World Championship and has been for the last 19 years. In fact, Skoda's, this automobile company's relationship with the Hockey Federation is one of the longest lasting sponsorships. And much to the disbelief of the rest of the world, the International Ice Hockey Federation has chosen to host its championship in Belarus. Why? Because Lukashenko, the dictator, is such a big fan of hockey. All the while, political prisoners, including presidential candidates, will be languishing in prison because of this dictator. Companies such as Skoda, Nike, and Reebok are among the major corporate sponsors of this federation championship in Belarus. Last year, I joined Congressman Mike Quigley of Chicago, the National Hockey League Hall of Famer turned European parliamentarian Peter Stasny, and wrote to the International Ice Hockey Federation President Rene Fassell urging the 2014 games in Belarus be suspended until the political prisoners are released. How can anyone celebrate the excitement of world-class sports championship when people are languishing in prison for their political beliefs? They ignored our request. I spoke to USA Hockey, which represents the United States in this federation. They paid no attention. It turns out the International Ice Hockey Federation will be meeting next month in Finland, Belarus is going to be on the agenda. It should be. It should be at the top of the agenda. The honor of hosting this prestigious international sporting event in a country where the president is regarded as Europe's last dictator is hardly a reflection of the quality of the sport that is involved. An ardent fan of ice hockey and the head of the Belarus National Olympic Committee rewarding Lukashenko with the 2014 World Ice Hockey Championship ignores his regime's atrocities. I've tried to reach out to Skoda, owned by Volkswagen, and Nike and Reebok and other sponsors to let them know that their image is at stake too if they validate this dictator's policies and give honor to a country which doesn't recognize the basic freedoms 
This photograph here is a photograph which shows the Skoda CEO, Winfred Bolland, in the center, along with the Hockey Federation President, Faisal, on the right, as they celebrate Skoda's commitment to sponsor the World Championship through 2017. Skoda contends that its sponsorship of the event does not indicate approval of what's going on in Belarus, simply their dedication to hockey. That doesn't show much courage. Lukashenko's preparations for this ice hockey tournament indicates that Belarus is expecting a lot of visitors and a big economic boost. I'm once again calling on the International Ice Hockey Federation in their meeting in Finland to consider this matter at the top of their agenda and to suspend their plans to hold the Federation Championship in Belarus in 2014. There are many other countries around the world more than anxious to join them and make this a championship well-deserving with a host country that is one we can be proud of. My feelings about this are not alone. The European Union recently widened sanctions against Lukashenko and his cronies. Lukashenko promptly recalled his Belarusian representative to the EU, after which EU ambassadors were withdrawn from Belarus. After a summit in Brussels earlier this month, Lukashenko, never at a loss for words, criticized the European Union politicians and railed on the German Foreign Minister Guido Westerwelle, the first openly gay minister in Germany. President Lukashenko said, it's better to be a dictator than be gay. That's a quote. He went on to say, Belarusians deserve to host the World Championship in 2014. Now, that's incredible. What sports organization wants to validate those comments? I want to close by saying that I hope that the International Ice Hockey Federation's annual Congress will make the right decision in May. I hope that its corporate sponsors will feel a little uneasy being associated with dictator Lukashenko and his policies in Belarus. I hope they will suspend the 2014 championship unless the political prisoners are at least released and that other international sporting groups, such as the International Cycling Union, follow their example. I want the United States, in partnership with the European Union, to continue to place pressure on Lukashenko to open up his political system and to stand by the Belarusian people in their efforts to bring justice to their country. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from North Carolina. Uh, Madam President, I ask to speak at, uh, at this, on, in morning business. Without objection. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I come here today to pay tribute to Senator Barbara Mikulski on becoming the longest serving women in the history of Congress. First and foremost, I feel deeply privileged to be able to serve alongside Senator Mikulski. She blazed a path that allowed the rest of us and people like me to be here today. And along the way, she distinguished herself as not only a leader and tenacious advocate for the people of Maryland, but for all Americans. Senator Mikulski's path to the U.S. Senate prepared her well to be an effective fighter for her constituents. Ever the dedicated public servant, Senator Mikulski worked as a Baltimore social worker, community activist, and as a city council member. She brought an urgency and an unrelenting commitment to service to her work and the people she represented. It can be seen in the legislation she has fought for and the causes she has championed during her 25 years in the Senate. I'm proud to say that the first bill I co-sponsored when I came to the Senate three years ago was one of Senator Mikulski's, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. This bill, which ensures that no matter your gender, race, national origin, religion, age, or disability, you will receive equal pay for equal work. The fight to get it signed into law is a perfect example of the tenacity and sense of fairness that drives Barbara Mikulski. I'm particularly grateful to her for her mentorship. On the day I was sworn into the Senate, I was standing in the back of the chamber waiting to walk down the, the, to the well. My colleague from North Carolina, Senator Burr, was with me. Senator Mikulski came up to me and said, who was going to escort me to the well to be sworn in? And I obviously said, my colleague from North Carolina. She said, well, you need a woman too. And with that, I was both humbled and honored to have her escort me down the chamber aisle to be sworn in as a United States Senator.
Her generosity in sharing her experience and her expertise did not stop on that day. She's always encouraging, supportive, and eager to foster a spirit of teamwork. And I especially appreciate that Senator Mikulski embraces the need for bipartisanship, which no doubt is why she is and has been so effective, accomplished, and widely respected. Everyone knows well and respects Senator Mikulski for her advocacy on behalf of women and families. In this regard, she is truly a role model. During the debate on health care reform, her tireless fight to ensure that women's preventive services, including screenings for breast and cervical cancer, would be covered with no out-of-pocket expenses. Her ability to see and understand people's needs is clearly reflected in her Spousal Anti-Impoverishment Act, which protects seniors across the country from going bankrupt while paying for a spouse's nursing home care. It is no wonder that she is beloved not only in the 3rd District, where she represented 10 years in Congress, but by all the people from Maryland whose interests she fights for every single day. As one of the 17 women now serving in the Senate, it's hard to imagine what it must have been like when she arrived here 25 years ago as one of two women. I'm grateful that she and the other female senators have paved the way. Barbara Mikulski is the dean of the women senators, and her bipartisan women's dinners are among my favorite Senate traditions. I thank Senator Mikulski for her leadership and strong belief in the empowerment of women in our communities and in public office. For those of us who came to Washington to make a difference, Barbara Mikulski has set a very high bar. I congratulate Senator Mikulski for this extraordinary and historic accomplishment, and I look forward to many more years of serving alongside her. Madam Chairman, I, Madam President, I would also like to speak for a couple of minutes on the Highway uh, Transportation Act. I am uh, come to the floor to express my support for passing the Senate bill before the current transportation authorization expires this Saturday. It would create and sustain nearly 41,000 41, jobs in North Carolina and across the country close to 3 million jobs. Earlier today, the House passed a short-term 90-day extension. Unfortunately, passing another stopgap extension is not the solution that businesses, states, and the entire country needs. Short-term extensions create instability and uncertainty in funding. And without that certainty, states like mine in North Carolina, we can't plan or move forward with projects which jeopardize tens of thousands of projects and millions of jobs in America. Once again, that's 41,000 jobs in North Carolina. Upgrading our infrastructure is not a Democratic or a Republican priority. It is truly an American priority. The Senate Transportation Funding Bill makes critical investments in transportation and infrastructure in North Carolina and across our nation. The return on investment is high. Moody's estimates that for every $1 spent on infrastructure, our GDP is raised about $1.59. Additionally, for every $1 billion spent on infrastructure, 11,000 to 30,000 jobs are created, jobs that North Carolina desperately needs. Failure to pass the Senate Transportation Bill could put these millions of jobs and $1.2 billion worth of North Carolina construction projects in jeopardy. This transportation bill that we're talking about is truly an economic engine. My state currently receives 92 cents for every dollar we pay into the Highway Trust Fund. This new legislation would ensure that at least 95% of the payments we pay in that would come back to our state, nearly 3% more than we currently receive. Maintaining and upgrading our infrastructure is not just about creating jobs in the construction sector. It's really the lifeblood of our communities. We need to make sure that businesses have roads to access their plants and factories, rail, ports, and airport runways to export goods across our globe, and to keep pace with a 24-7 global economy. To put this in a global perspective, China currently spends four times as much on infrastructure as we do in the United States. We can't allow this to continue. This is about staying competitive and leveraging common sense investments that will enable our economy to grow. 
This transportation funding bill will be used to improve our roads, bridges, and mass transit systems, projects that will put North Carolinians back to work and help American businesses compete in our global economy. I urge my colleagues to take up and pass the Senate transportation funding bill without delay. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator, Senator from North Dakota. Uh, I ask to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Madam President, I rise today to introduce bipartisan energy legislation, the Domestic Fuels Act. It's legislation designed to help hardworking Americans uh, with the high fuel prices, the high gas prices they're paying at the pump. It's legislation to truly help us do all of the above when it comes to producing and providing uh, lower cost energy for American consumers, for American businesses, and to fuel our economy, to help create jobs, and also to create greater national energy security. It is part of what I believe that we need to do to truly have an energy security plan for our country. So I'd like to take just a few minutes to, uh, to talk about the Domestic Fuels Act. I'm going to start with a quick review of gas prices. As we all very well know, gas prices are high and they continue to go higher. I believe that AAA this week indicated that the national average price for gasoline of, uh, for a gallon of gasoline is $3.91 a gallon. National average, $3.91. Now, gasoline prices over the last three years, since the current administration took office, have gone up, have more than doubled, more than doubled, uh, from about, uh, oh, roughly $1.87 to, as I say, national average today of more than $3.90. I believe there's nine states right now where, on average, gasoline is more than $4 a gallon. Uh, in Chicago, for example, I believe it's about $4.68 cents a gallon. Over here I just uh, uh, checked not too long ago, I think it's four dollars and thirty-nine cents a gallon, just a few blocks here from the Capitol. This put an enormous uh, pressure, enormous strain on American consumers, on hard-working Americans every day being forced to fill their car at the, at the uh, gas tank and spending uh, close to four dollars and, and some predictions are at, at uh, later this summer it may go to, to five dollars a gallon. So clearly we've got to find a way to uh, help with gasoline prices uh, across this country. And what it comes down to is supply and demand. More supply creates downward pressure on gasoline prices. More demand, of course, pushes prices higher. So we've got to find ways to increase the supply and increase the supply in a dependable way. And that means not only increasing supply now, but having policies in place that increase supply now and in the future. We need to send signals to the market that we are serious about growing our supply of energy, of all types of energy, certainly uh, uh, gas and oil, but all types of energy in this country, as well as working with neighbors that we can count on, like Canada, to produce more supply to help reduce the price of gasoline at the pump, and, and frankly, to help reduce the supply, or the cost, excuse me, the cost of all types of energy, to really help get this economy going, to have more national security, to have more jobs to put the uh, 13 million people who are unemployed back to work. Energy is a key aspect of creating the type of economic environment that's going to help us do that. This chart shows our current level of crude oil production in the country. This, the first bar shows that between ourselves and with Canada, that we produce just under 10 million barrels of crude and crude equivalent uh, right now. So in North America, Canada, and the United States, just under 10 million barrels of crude today. That comes from not only conventional drilling, but from uh, oil shale, from tight oil, from the oil sands, uh, offshore, all these different sources. Under the current policies we have, you can see by looking at this next bar that over the next 15 years, the supply of oil and gas coming from Canada and the United States will shrink. 
under the current policies and the current approach, without the kind of energy policy we need in this country, we actually will have less oil and gas from Canada and the United States over the next 15 years. So the key is this, we really have to implement the kind of energy policy in this country that will help us produce more energy, more oil and gas, more energy from all sources, traditional and renewable. And that's exactly what we're talking about today with this Domestic Fuels Act. The third bar on this chart shows that just from oil and gas, just from oil and gas, with the right kinds of policies over the next 15 years, and this is a 15 year time frame, we can produce more oil and gas in Canada and the United States than we consume. So before you bring in other types of energy, biofuels, any other types of energy, any type of renewable energy you want to include, just from oil and gas with the right kind of policies in Canada and the United States over the next 15 years, we can produce more energy than we consume. Think what that means in terms of helping bring down the price of gasoline. Think what that means in terms of creating jobs in our country. Think of what that means in terms of national security, not needing to depend on crude oil from the Middle East. Think how important that is. And that's just with the right kind of policies to develop more oil and gas. And of course, we can develop all of the other types of energy resources as well. So my point is, let's not take 15 years to get this done. Let's have a plan for national energy security that gets it done in the next five to seven years. And there's no question that we can do it. We can absolutely do it. How do we do it? Very straightforward, very simple, very common sense. When we talk about producing all of the above, let's actually produce all the above. Let's not say all of the above and then block energy production. Let's have the kind of energy policies in place, traditional sources of energy, renewable sources of energy, on a bipartisan basis. Let's put the type of policies in place that will truly help us uh, to energy security in this country. And let's do it over the next five to seven years. Let's increase oil production in the United States and Canada. Let's have the policies that help us produce more oil onshore and off. Let's increase natural gas production and usage. And again, let's join with Canada to do this North American energy security. Between the United States and Canada, we have incredible potential. We're the closest friends and allies in the world. Let's work together. Let's tap that amazing potential. Let's increase the use of renewable fuels that we produce right here at home we can do that with a market-based approach. So let's increase our use of renewable fuels with market-based approaches that work. And let's use technology to drive energy production, produce more energy, and to do it with better environmental stewardship. We can do all of these things. So when we talk about uh, an energy security plan or the path to energy security in our country, these are very common sense steps. I have bills, other members of this body, bipartisan basis, we have bills to do all of these things, to increase oil production, increase our use of natural gas, increase the use of renewables with market-based approaches, and use technology to, to drive not only more energy production, but to do it with better environmental stewardship. In fact, let's just talk about a couple of those. One of the things that I've put legislation, submitted legislation to do is to approve the Keystone XL pipeline. It's been a uh, an issue that's been very much uh, uh, in the national uh, discussion. It's gotten a lot of attention, but it's a very straightforward concept. It's, it simply says, let's develop the infrastructure in our country so that as we produce more oil in Canada, and Canada, by the way, has the third largest oil reserves in the world. Number one is Saudi Arabia. Number two is Venezuela. Number three is Canada. So let's work with Canada to tap and use more of that oil. If we don't, it's going to China. But we can do it. We simply have to develop the infrastructure and work with Canada. Well, what's the opposition to that oil development been? Well, a number of arguments have come up, but the main one really behind it is that some people say, well, we just don't want to produce oil in the oil sands. Just don't want to do it. The concern 
in their opinion, is greenhouse gas. And it has about a 6% higher greenhouse gas emission than conventional drilling, conventional production. But the important point here is, going back to the last bullet that I mentioned in this National uh, Energy Security Plan, is let's use technology to produce more energy with better stewardship. What I mean by that, when we talk about the oil sands, rather than using the current excavation method, 80% of the new development is going to in situ. In situ is essentially drilling. So you've got basically the same footprint and basically the same greenhouse gas emission as conventional drilling for oil and gas. So let's use that new technology to produce more energy, to produce more oil in the Canadian oil sands, and not only produce more energy, but do it with better environmental stewardship. So that now we're getting oil from a dependable friend and ally, Canada, rather than getting 30% of our crude from places like the Middle East and Venezuela. It's just common sense. And we win with more energy at a lower cost, we win with job creation, and we win with better environmental stewardship. We just need to get the right policy, the right law, and the right approach to the, how we regulate these things in place. That's what the Domestic Fuels Act is all about. It is an example of exactly how we do, do just that. The, the Domestic Fuels Act essentially says, all right, when you pull up to the gas station, you should be able to get whatever fuel provides the best uh, energy, provides what you need at the best possible price. It is about consumer choice, and it is about lowering the cost at the pump. Right now, when you pull up, very often the, uh, the petroleum retail marketer has multiple tanks in order to produce or to dispense various types of fuel. It might be traditional gasoline from petroleum. It might be eth some blend of petroleum and ethanol. He might have biodiesel. And increasingly, service stations, gas stations, are looking to market natural gas. But think about it. If they have to have a different set of tanks, different set of piping, and a different dispensers for each type of fuel, then they have to make a choice, don't they? They can maybe offer gasoline from petroleum. They can maybe offer some ethanol blend. They can maybe offer biodiesel. Or maybe they try natural gas, right? But if they have to have tanks and pumps and piping for each one, think of the cost. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. So how do you get consumer choice? How do you get consumer choice in there? Also, how do you get the lowest price? If petroleum-based gasoline versus ethanol-based is cheaper, well, then maybe he wants to be offering straight petroleum, not have a blend. But if he can mix it with ethanol, offer e even up to E85, and that's cheaper, he may want to offer that. If he wants to offer biodiesel rather than just traditional diesel, or if he wants to offer natural gas so that you increasingly have trucks and buses, particularly in our urban areas, using natural gas, how does he do it? And that's just the point. What this act provides is that the EPA has to streamline the process so that that service station, that gas station, can use his tanks and his equipment, his existing tanks and equipment, so he can decide to offer any one of those products. Any one of those products. Now you've got more consumer choice, and you've got a way to drive down prices at the pump, drive down the cost of gasoline, drive down the cost of, of biofuels, drive down the cost of natural gas, whatever it is. Consumer choice, lower prices. And that extends back through the production chain as well. Now if I produce ethanol, if I produce biodiesel, if I produce gasoline, if I produce natural gas, I know I'm going to be able to market those products to consumers. This is about looking to the future instead of looking to the past. This isn't about government spending any more money. This is about the government empowering industry, empowering entrepreneurship, empowering the energy sector, empowering our consumers with choice and lower costs at the pump. 
And it's just common sense. It's just common sense. We give the marketer a way to market whatever product makes the most sense and whatever best serves his consumer at the best price. We give him liability protection so that he knows he can go forward and offer these different products without worrying about being sued and losing his livelihood. So he's willing to do it. And we provide a clear and simple pathway so he knows what he has to accomplish in order to best serve his consumers and build his business. This is about the right kind of legal framework. This is about the right kind of legislation that is clear, understandable, and empowering. This is how we get government working for people rather than people working for government. This is how we build the right kind of energy future based on all of the above. This isn't about just saying, hey, let's do all of the above when it comes to energy development. This is about doing it. This is about making a difference for the American consumer, and we can do it. This legislation is bipartisan legislation. I'm very pleased that Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri is co-sponsoring it with me, along with Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota, Mike Crapo uh, of Idaho, and I believe that we'll have many others joining us on both sides of the aisle. Also, we are also working with uh, Representative John Simpkus in the House, who will be introducing companion legislation as well. And the other point I want to make in concluding is that we have broad-based support from people from companies and people who work in the traditional energy sector as well as the renewable energy sector who make the equipment that dispense uh, gasoline and, and other types of fuel products and the people who sell gasoline and all types of fuel. They're all on board. Let me give you an example. Uh, from the uh, renewable fuels uh, energy sector, we have the Renewable Fuels Association who's endorsed this legislation and also Growth Energy. From uh, traditional oil and gas, the American Petroleum Institute has endorsed this legislation, as has Tesoro Corporation and ExxonMobil, and there are many others. Uh, from the, the gas station service station and the marketers that actually dispense the product, Endorsing this legislation is the National Association of Convenience Stores, the Society of Independent Gasoline Marketers of America, the Petroleum Marketers Association of America, and the National Association of Truck Stop Operators. And from the people that make the equipment, uh, the, the manufacturers that make the equipment, uh, we've received endorsements as well, the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers, uh, and also the Outdoor Power Equipment Institute. Look, everybody's on board with this. Now we need to get to work and get it in place. This is about building the right kind of energy future for our country. Uh, we've got to get going. Gasoline prices are $4 at the pump and they're going higher. And we can do something about it and that's exactly what we need to do. And I urge my colleagues to join me in this effort on behalf of the American people. Madam President, with that I yield the floor. I also note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. Senator from Iowa. Opening business, right? Yes, we are, Senator. Actually, we're on, we're on S. Okay. I asked, we're in a quorum call. I, I, I ask that the calling of the quorum be suspended. Without objection. Yeah. And I ask to speak 15 minutes as it's been morning business. Without objection. <clears throat> Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg, on a recent trip to Egypt, made comments that garnered public notice. She said, quote, I would not look to the U.S. Constitution if I were drafting a Constitution in the year 2012. I might look at the Constitution of South Africa, end of quote. 
She also spoke favorably of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the European Convention on Human Rights. Although some people have criticized Justice Ginsburg for speaking negatively about the U.S. Constitution while abroad, I think she has a right to say what legal documents countries uh, that are now writing constitutions should consider. But I do not agree with her that those other constitutions are better examples of constitutions today than the United States Constitution is. Some people have criticized Justice Ginsburg's preference for the other constitutions she named have focused on the positive rights contained in those documents. Some of those constitutions, like South Africa, protects the right to, quote, make decisions concerning reproduction, unquote, to, quote, inherit dignity, end of quote, and the right to have an environment protected, quote, through reasonable legislative and other measures that prevent pollution and environmental degradation. The European Convention on Human Rights guarantees the right to education. Of course, none of these constitutions contains anything like a Second Amendment right for the citizens to defend themselves. Our Constitution is all about limiting the power of government. Americans do not fully trust the power of government, and Americans insist on rights that are protected against government action. In other words, our Constitution was intended to last for centuries with the same meaning even as those principles were applied to new situations. Our judges should reflect that philosophy, which is at the heart of our Constitution. And if other countries feel differently, that is their right. But I think praise for those foreign constitutions rather than our own raises a much more serious issue, the role of the judiciary. Our Constitution made the judiciary that was the least dangerous branch, that's what Hamilton said, policy is to be made by elected officials who answer to the voters and can be replaced, whereas judges under our Constitution cannot be replaced. They have a lifetime position short of impeachment. But the foreign constitutions that were named create a much different judiciary. The Canadian Supreme Court has stated that their Charter of Rights and Freedoms, quote, must be capable of growth and development over time to meet new social, political, and historical realities often unimagined by its framers. Continuing to quote, the judiciary is a guardian of the Constitution and must, in interpreting its provisions, bear these considerations in mind, end of quote. The European Convention has been interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights to be a quote-unquote living document. Mr. President, these are explicit statements that Justice Ginsburg preferred constitutions. Madam President, these are explicit statements that Justice Ginsburg's preferred constitutions are quote-unquote living constitutions. A living constitution is one thing in which the meanings change over time. Judges decide that new circumstances requiring a living constitution to mean something that it did not mean some time before. They say that the constitution must keep up with the times. A living constitution can mean whatever judges want it to mean, completely contrary to what our forefathers had in mind when they wrote our Constitution. Our Constitution, then, is not a living Constitution. Judges are not to make up its meaning as they go along over time. Even President Obama's Supreme Court nominees told us <clears throat> that the role of a judge under our Constitution is not to interpret words however they believe new circumstances might warrant it's the law all the way down, quote unquote, Justice Kagan said. We should be skeptical of a living constitution that open the door for judges to impose their values, not those of the framers of the Constitution, on the citizenry of this country. 
The Canadian Charter says that it, quote, guarantees the right and freedom set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, end of quote. The Canadian Supreme Court interprets that provision in light of a highly generalized four-part test that invites judges to insert their own policy preferences. Similarly, the South African Constitution provides that its rights can be limited if they, quote, are reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom, end of quote. It tells courts explicitly to apply a six-part subjective balancing test that allows judges to interpret this provision however they want. How would you like to live under a constitution like that? These constitutions that Justice Ginsburg endorses invites judges to rule however they want on any question of rights. So that is not consistent with traditional American notion of the rule of law, of a government of laws, and not a government of people. Some judges may prefer constitutions in which judges are free to displace democratically, democratic decision-making on policy questions that are to be decided by elected representatives of the people under our Constitution. I do not. Our Constitution does not. We do not live in a government of, by, and for the judiciary. But no one should think that the Canadian or the South American or South African constitutions fully protect rights that Americans think are precious, such as freedom of speech. Under the Canadian Charter, reasonable limits of free speech, including prohibiting so-called hate speech against a group. Finally, Madam President, it is important to recognize why some of us on the Judiciary Committee continue to press judicial nominees on their adherence to the Constitution without reference to foreign law. For instance, Justice Breyer has stated that foreign judges also interpret, quote, text that more and more protect basic human rights, end of quote. He has stated that he looks to the decisions of the European Human Rights Court and to Canadian cases as well because they are, quote, unquote, relevant even if they do not control. He, he says this, quote, we can learn something about our law and our documents from what happens elsewhere. End of quote. What Justice Ginsburg did was to make very clear that which had only been implied in the past, making very clear that there are some in this country who feel that our venerable Constitution is outdated. If they treat that document as it was written and understood by the framers, then their decisions will often lead to results that they do not like as a policy matter. But if they can cite decisions from foreign courts that interpret constitutions that contain all kinds of different rights and that give judges unbridled power to make policy decisions at the expense of the elected representatives of the people, then they can reach decisions that our Constitution otherwise would not allow. It is not simply a disinterested survey of what other courts around the world are doing. It opens the door to a search for preferred liberal activist outcomes. These are the very high stakes at issue when we discuss whether it is appropriate for judges to cite and rely on foreign law in interpreting the United States Constitution. We need to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. We need to preserve, protect, and defend the rights of American citizens. Justice Ginsburg's and others 
who have a judicial longing for other constitutions that protect different rights and give unelected judges power that under our Constitution self-governing people exercise themselves, I tell those judges, including Justice Ginsburg, that is the wrong approach. I yield the floor, yield back the balance of my time. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.